Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. If you're new here, my name is Ali. I'm a junior doctor working in Cambridge. And today we're kicking off a brand new series on this channel called How to Survive Medical School. And this is gonna end up being a series of at least 20 videos. And in each video, me and various of my friends who I've interviewed for the last few months are gonna be giving you guys advice on how to survive various bits of medical school. So we're gonna be doing videos on things like learning on the wards, how to do well in OSCEs, how to write essays, how to get publications, work-life balance, best resources, how to take notes, all of this sort of stuff. But in this video, I'm gonna be sharing various tips that I wish I knew as a first year medical student. And we're gonna be focusing more on like the study side of things and like coping with the workload as opposed to the social side. To be honest, the social side kind of takes care of itself. And I've done another video with my friend Maticus where we talk about tips for freshers, like, you know, how to make friends easily and all this sort of stuff. But in this video, I really wanna focus on the specifics of kind of advice that will hopefully help you when it comes to the workload of your first year of medical school. So to that end, I spent today writing down all the various bits of advice I could think of and picked 10 of them to go into like a 10 tips thing. So that's all gonna be in the timestamps in the description below. So if you wanna skip around, you can. If you don't wanna watch this whole video all in one go, you don't have to. It might end up being quite long and rambly, but this is a topic that I could literally go on about for hours and hours. So I'm, you know, splitting these up into these 10 bits just to give some semblance of structure to this video because everyone loves a well-structured video. So let's just get started with point number one. And the first thing I wanted to say is that every medical school is different. And as much as we might like to think that medicine is all the same everywhere and it's like a standardized thing, it's really not. Every medical school does their syllabus in their own little way. So I'm probably not the right person to be giving you very specific advice on what the best resources are, for example. That's been a really common question on Instagram. You know, what textbook would you recommend for X? And that kind of depends on what your course is like. So at Cambridge, for example, we had to write essays in our physiology exam about the structure and function and the discovery of the sodium pump. Whereas, you know, if you're at a different medical school, they might not care about, you know, how the sodium pump was first discovered and, you know, making you write a five page essay about it. Instead, it might be more clinically focused. So, you know, the sorts of textbooks and resources you'd be using to write about the sodium pump are gonna be different, you know, depending on what the course is like. As such, probably the single biggest tip I can give for you is to make friends with people in years above you. Now, this is not like, being back in secondary school. In secondary school, when you go in in year seven, you are literally the bottom of the, you know, the totem pole. I don't know what the phrase is. Uh, you know, the year nines are gonna think they're too cool for you and they're not gonna wanna be your friend because you're like a little year seven. But that completely changes when you get to university, specifically when you get to medical school. As a first year, in a way, you have the highest social capital that you ever will. And the second years are gonna to wanna to be friends with you. The third years are gonna to wanna to be friends with you. The fourth years are gonna feel a bit weird about wanting to be friends with you, but they'll still wanna be friends with you regardless. So don't think that these guys are older than you and cooler than you and you can't approach them. People will absolutely love it if you go up to them and say, hey, look, you know, you're a second year, you're a third year. I don't, you know, I'm, 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 just, I'm just a first year, I'm looking for advice. Can you help me? What are your favorite resources? Can you share some of your notes with me? What advice do you have for X, Y, Z? So that's point number one, make friends with your seniors. They will really, really help you. They've been through the system. They've been through exactly the same course. They can give you all of the resources that they have. And that's one of the things that made my own personal experience in medical school a lot easier because I made friends with people in years above through societies and through my own college. And they were all so kind and happy to share notes with me. And that is something I've continued on for people in the year below me. All right, point number two is begin with the exam in mind. Now this might sound weird to say, I know like when you get into medical school, you sort of think that the objective is to become a good doctor. But when you're in your first year, the objective is really not to become a good doctor. Becoming a good doctor is, you know, five, six, six plus years down the line. When you're in your first year, in the vast majority of medical degrees, you're focused on learning the basic sciences, you're focused on understanding it, and you're focused on doing as well as you can in the exam, ideally without you know, working yourself into a mental breakdown or equivalent. So we don't wanna be thinking, oh, I wonder if this will help my clinical practice six years from now. We wanna be thinking, how do I most efficiently revise for the exam that I've got at the end of the year without allowing my life to get completely destroyed? And to that end, we do need to keep the exam in mind. So pretty much the earlier you can start having a look at the past papers that you're gonna get, the better it'll be for you. Because especially like, you know, let's take something like anatomy, for example, if you get a big anatomy textbook like Gray's Anatomy or Clinically Oriented Anatomy or whatever, you know, there's just so much stuff in there and there is no way they're gonna be testing you on all of it. And I know people love the idea of, of like working from textbooks and I'm gonna talk more about that in a later point. But you know, if you know what sort of questions they're gonna ask you in your, in your exam, you can tailor your learning of the subject and your revision of the subject to words, that sort of thing. And like, you know, everyone is gonna get to a reasonable baseline standard anyway. And to be honest, by next year and the year after, you're gonna forget the vast majority of the anatomy that you memorized for the first year exam anyway. 
But, you know, the more efficient you can be, the more efficient you can be at preparing yourself specifically for the sorts of exams you're going to get, the more kind of the easier you will find it to go through medical school. And you won't be bogged down by these like, you know, pages and pages of textbooks where the vast majority of it is not going to be examined. Thirdly, having just <laughs> said that you should keep the exam in mind, I want to implore you to try and understand the big picture of your subjects and to not focus or obsess too much about the details. There's a there's a good quote that I came across on you know some websites say, saying that you know relying on memorization is a recipe for disaster or words to that effect. You do not want to be relying on memorizing the facts. You want to be relying on understanding the general concepts. And even in something like anatomy and pharmacology, where it's you know it might seem at first glance like a list of facts that you have to learn, even in those subjects, there is still a lot of understanding sort of stuff based around it. For me, the litmus test that I use to determine whether I understand something is to ask myself, would I be able to explain this to a five-year-old? And I think this is something to do with like the Feynman technique. Richard Feynman supposedly used to do something like that. Would I be able to explain this to a five-year-old? You know, do I really understand how kind of the brachial plexus works? Can I draw a diagram and explain it in very, very simple words in a way that a five-year-old would understand? There's a few little things that I kind of picked up throughout medical school that I would, I would recommend people might like to try to sort of test test your understanding of stuff. One of them is asking yourself the question, and why is this bad? Right? So let's say you've come across, I don't know, something like inflammation in pathology for the first time, or you're learning about HIV within immunology. And, and then, you know, you find that HIV reduces your CD4 count. And you ask yourself, okay, why is this bad? And then you answer yourself, okay, this is bad because if I have less or rather fewer CD4 plus cells, then I will not be able to mount an immune response. Why is that bad? That is bad because the next time I get an infection, it's going to kill me because I won't be able to mount an immune response to it. So when learning about diseases and stuff, that's something I keep in the back of my mind. You know, why is this bad? Because it really helps me focus down on exactly, you know, actually understanding what's going on. Secondly, one thing I like to ask myself is how pissed off would I be if I got this particular disease? Let's say I'm, lear I'm learning about primary sclerosing cholangitis. And, you know, I've, I've never seen it in real life because, you know, I'm still a preclinical medical student and I'm learning it because, you know, it's anat the anatomy of the biliary tree is sort of relevant. And I know that if I mention primary sclerosing cholangitis in my essay, that'll get me a first because that adds clinical, you know, flair to my essay. Let's say I'm, I'm, I'm learning about that. But, you know, inside a textbook or inside, you know, a, any kind of revision guide, you just don't really appreciate whether a disease is you know, like really, really, really bad, or if it's just like, oh, it's 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 a little bit annoying to have, but it's not catastrophic, or, oh, you know, it's just like having a bit of a, you know, a bit of a toothache for a day. It's kind of annoying for a day, but then it goes away. So like asking that question of how pissed off would I be if I got this condition is something that I like to do personally. And again, something that I think helps, helps understanding uh, various disease processes. Okay, point number four, I would highly recommend building in active recall and spaced repetition into your study routine from day one. Now, if you haven't seen my videos about spaced repetition and about active recall, please watch those. When I first learned about those in my second year of studying medicine and like all of my friends, like we came across that topic for the first time in a lecture, it completely blew our minds. I mean, we're thinking, why has no one ever told us about how to study efficiently? This active recall thing and the space repetition thing is absolutely incredible. I wish I had known about it 10 years ago, so I wouldn't have had to struggle through GCSEs and A-levels and first year of medicine. So please, like, if you haven't seen those videos, please watch them. Basically, in those videos, I say that rereading, highlighting, and taking notes, controversially, are quite ineffective, inefficient revision strategies. Not decided by me, decided by, you know, scientists who've studied this and looked at all of the various research papers done on university students like yourself about, you know, how they memorize and understand and learn stuff. And they found that these two techniques of spaced repetition and active recall are by far the best. So um, how do you use active recall? It really doesn't matter. Um, I get this message a lot. You know, what specific tactics do you use for active recall? I talk a few about a few of them in the active recall video, which I'll link up there and down there and in the, in the video description and everywhere. But essentially active recall just means testing yourself because the more often and the harder you work to retrieve information from your brain, the more that information is gonna get encoded and the more you will retain it and you know be able to recall it at a later date. We should not be thinking of recall, you know, retrieving and testing ourselves as something that we just do in the exam. We should be thinking of testing ourselves as being you know, probably the most crucial component of learning to begin with. Secondly, space repetition. Again, I talk a lot more about that in the actual video about space repetition. But essentially, you know, if you've if you've done a topic, write down the date that you that you've kind of done the topic, um, and then just you know make a note to yourself to review it again in three days' time. 
and then you reviewed it again in three days time and then review it again a week later and then two weeks later and suddenly by the end of the term you'll find that you're actually retaining a lot of this information whereas a lot of your your friends your colleagues who have not been using space repetition are going to get to the end of the term and realize oh wow I've literally forgotten everything about the upper limb that we learned in week one and two in anatomy and I just about remember the stuff we just covered so that's one of those things that, you know, the more you can use spaced repetition and the more disciplined you can be with yourself about actively, you know, using spaced repetition, the more efficient your whole life will become. It's just an absolutely incredible technique. The research says it and literally everyone I know who uses it swears by it and says it's the best thing ever in addition to active recall. Okay, point number five, please, you will really be glad if you do just a little bit of work each day. Just a little bit of work. Even just 20 minutes of work each day is better than nothing. And actually, 20 minutes of work each day is infinitely better than nothing. We can all find 20 minutes in our day to just do a little bit of work to review some of the practice questions that we wrote for ourselves because we're practicing active recall. Even if, you know, you can't be bothered with active recall because it takes a lot of brain power. Even spending 20 minutes just pre-reading for your lectures the next day is really, really going to help. In my experience, like the two biggest categories of people that end up struggling a lot through medical school is firstly people unfortunately with a history of mental health problems who uh, you know find that the atmosphere of medical school exacerbates the issues that they have already and there's not really much I can offer about that you know through this video but what I can offer advice to is that second category of people the ones who really struggle when it comes to exam term because they have literally done zero work the whole year Towards exam season last year, I started. I was, I was getting messages on Instagram from people saying, oh, have you got any tips about how I can use your active recall spreadsheet to cram learning all of anatomy into two weeks because I haven't done any work throughout the year. And then like, yeah, you can, you can try, but if you, you know, spend the whole year not doing anything, you're completely hamstringing yourself. And the way space repetition works, you know, I keep, I keep going on about space repetition. Like doing 20 minutes a day consistently is going to be so much better than cramming for the exam because it's just, there's, just, it, there's so much evidence about it you know we all know it in our you know in our hearts that cramming is only good for short-term short-term retrieval space repetition and you know spreading things out over, over a long period of time is by far the better way of retaining information so if you can just get yourself into the habit of just doing a little bit of work each day your life will be so so much easier because of it i've also had messages on instagram from people saying how much work should i do each day doing an hour a day is pretty good um but again it's not really about the time it's about how efficient it is and you know if you're if you're the sort of person that busts busts out their you know big ass gray's anatomy original first edition textbook and starts highlighting and copying out making notes from it it's going to take you five hours to do what someone else might do in 20 minutes using you know a website wikipedia and anki flashcards so like it's not really about how many hours you put in as much as that narrative is really common especially amongst our parents especially if you're from like india and pakistan and like the subcontinent there are so many messages i've had from people from india saying that oh you know but you know in our in our medical school school our professors tell us we have to be pouring over our textbooks for like eight hours a day and that's just like really not an efficient way of doing it. Uh, what was I saying? Yeah, just do a little bit of work each day. It doesn't really matter how much, as long as you can do it consistently. And the more efficient you can be with it using spaced repetition and active recall, the better your life will be in the long run. Okay, having talked about spaced repetition and mentioned Anki, a lot of you are gonna be using Anki flashcards or Quizlet or other sort of flashcard apps, even physical flashcards, people still use those, you know, if you're feeling really old school. One of the biggest mistakes you can make and I've had messages about this already, is you're probably making too many flashcards, especially right at the start where you don't yet have this big picture understanding of what anatomy is and what physiology is and you know how the lungs work. Especially that early on and when you haven't looked at your exam papers, the temptation is gonna be there to write down every single detail from your lectures, from your slides, from your books, and turn it into flashcards because you're thinking, oh, it's only 30 flashcards on, you know, this respiratory lecture one. And I've only got eight respiratory lectures. So that's about 240 flashcards in all my respiratory lectures. And I've only got eight topics. Oh, hang on. That's about 3000 cards just for physiology. That That's just, that's just way too many. Um, in fact, I'd probably recommend avoiding making flashcards at least for the first few weeks until you have a better idea of how, how everything kind of fits together. Like when I started clinical medicine in my fourth year, I decided I was gonna memorize the Oxford Handbook of Clinical Medicine, which you'll probably find over there somewhere. Uh, I decided I was gonna memorize this and because I was an idiot and because I didn't take the time to get a big picture understanding of what was going on in clinical medicine, I decided to start by memorizing the details of henoch schonlein purpura and hemolytic uremic syndrome, which are two semi-niche things that are just like not that common and absolutely not the first thing that a clinical medical student should be learning when I didn't yet know what a heart attack was or like how to deal with COPD or how to deal with atrial fibrillation and like the really, really common bog standard stuff. So this is a trap that so many people fall into. It's by far the biggest complaint on any sort of Anki-based discussion forum that 
I've got too many flashcards, I'm feeling overwhelmed, I don't know what to do. So my advice would be tone down the number of flashcards you make. Um, I'll, I'll put a few links in the, in the description below to some websites that have some really good advice about Anki and I'm going to be doing a much more specific video where I talk about exactly how I'd recommend using Anki for medical school. But yeah, if you're using Anki or any sort of flashcards and you're feeling overwhelmed, take a step back, try and understand the big picture, don't worry about making flashcards about every little detail. Right, point number seven, I think I've lost count. Uh, Pre-reading for lectures is a incredibly useful and almost almost never done thing that you can do. Like, you know, let's say you've got three lectures the next day. It's it's kind of hard if you have like 10 lectures the next day, but let's say you've got three lectures the next day. In Cambridge, we were lucky. We only ever had like three lectures a day tops. Most days we only had two. Some days even had one. It's pretty doable to spend, you know, your 20 minutes of work that, you know, the day before just reading over the lecture notes, reading over the slides, or if you don't have the lecture notes or the slides, but you know what topic they're going to be talking about, just kind of have a breeze through the topic on Wikipedia or on Google. There's no need to bust out your big, you know, pathology textbook. Just have a look on Wikipedia, see what the general principles, what the kind of chapter headings of that topic would be, write them down somewhere. And, you know, just doing that will give you a lot more out of going to that lecture. I'll be honest, when I was in first year, I used to attend lectures for the purposes of sleeping. I found it easier to sleep in lectures than I did in my own bed. So I'd go to the lecture and I'd just kind of find myself dozing and there was nothing I could do to stop it. I used to get my college friends to like poke me in the sides because I'm like super ticklish. I used to get them to poke me in the sides and wake me up. But then I'd kind of like do this and everyone would kind of look around me and smile because like everyone knew what was going on. And like, if you look around a lecture hall, you'll see about half of it, either sleeping or, you know, watching the football on their MacBook or whatever. Um, but I found that on the few lectures where I did manage to pre-read, and I did this a lot more in second year and a lot more in third year and, and, and beyond, when I managed to pre-read the lectures, I understood it so much more. I was able to take more and I was able to engage more with the lecture and my notes were even better quality. So yeah, if you can do it, then please pre-read for your lectures. It will change your life if you can do it consistently. Okay, nearly there. Point number eight, textbooks are massively overrated. And I know this is very controversial advice because we as medical students absolutely love the fact that, hold on, We absolutely love the fact that we can, you know, get this big, big textbook and it feels really heavy and we love, you know, sticking it in front of us and like flicking through the pages and like highlighting bits and thinking, you know what, I'm a medical student because I've got this big textbook and that is how medical students should be and that, you know, everything in the world is good because I've got my textbook in front of me. Textbooks are massively overrated. Textbooks are sort of good if you are looking through them with the with the intention of finding out specific bits of information or with the intention of understanding a particular topic. And then you should close the book and just forget about it and never open it again. Because the problem with textbooks is, is that they encourage, A, a very linear way of looking at things. They encourage you to start from chapter one and then go to chapter 84. And, you know, stuff like your lectures aren't going to be organized in that fashion medicine isn't really organized in that fashion textbooks also encourage you to think that you have to learn all this information especially if your medical school like teachers or whatever are telling you that oh hey you know our recommended reading is vote vote and pratt's principles of biochemistry which is like a thousand page textbook where you know to be honest everything in the exam is going to come from from the lecture notes anyway um so textbooks are overrated I would recommend actually using resources like Wikipedia, using Google to find out information. You know, let's say you want to find out the nerve supply to, I don't know, the biceps brachii. You can just Google it and find it on Wikipedia. Uh, or let's say you want to try and memorize or you know understand the function of all the muscles of the upper limb. Find a YouTube video about it, find it on Wikipedia, find it on Google, find it on a website called Instant Anatomy. It's a good website. Um, don't open up your Gray's Anatomy or your Clinically Oriented Anatomy unless you're looking for like a specific thing that is going to help your understanding or help your essays or whatever become a little bit better. And I wish that someone had told me this when I was in my first year, because in my first year, I really glamorized this idea of textbooks. Uh, my mom is a doctor and she's from the generation that also massively glamorizes the idea of textbooks. I went out and bought Guyton and Hall's Principles of Physiology. And to be honest, it's a good book and it does help for understanding. But my mom's theory was that, look, you know, every day, just read five pages of Guyton. And if you read five pages of Guyton a day, by the end of the year, you'll know all of physiology. But that's just not how it works. Like reading from a textbook is not how we retain information. All the evidence says that how we retain information is spaced repetition and active recall. And I think that, you know, this culture of relying on big to heavy textbooks and even worse, this culture of thinking that we are doing something good by relying on big heavy textbooks is counterproductive. Sure, it works for some people, but if you're finding that you're getting overwhelmed with textbooks, then I'd suggest put them away. Don't open them again. Use the internet, use kind of these mini revision guides. 
um, yeah, those will serve you a lot better than medical textbooks will. At least that's what I found and that's what the vast majority of my friends found. But now, speaking of resources, loads of you have asked what resources would you recommend or what textbooks would you recommend? Uh, so the answer is I would not recommend a single textbook. Guyton and Hall, actually, to be honest, is quite good in terms of understanding physiology. But to be honest, all of that stuff you can get from osmosis videos on YouTube. They're really good. Or just like random videos on YouTube or just Wikipedia or Google or whatever. Um, you don't need textbooks. You, sp you, you especially don't need to buy any textbooks because the vast majority of medical schools in the world will have libraries where you have those textbooks. Um, and if you are more inventively minded, you might want to, and I'm not suggesting this, but you might type in the name of the textbook and type in free PDF on Google and you'll find a PDF that if you wanted to, and if you were so inclined, you could just download onto your iPad and you know, you've got the textbook if you need it. And you can use Control F as well. And then you can find specific stuff that you're looking for rather than trying to you know, go on the index and whatever. Anyway, what resources would I recommend? So let's start with anatomy. Um, basically two things I would recommend for, for anatomy. Number one is Instant Anatomy. Now this is a website that's created by Bob Whitaker, who's one of the anatomy profs, I think he's a professor or, or something at Cambridge. It's actually really good. And the reason why I think it's good is because it simplifies anatomy. Um, the problem with Gray's Anatomy and other textbooks is that you get very complicated diagrams. Whereas in Bob Whitaker's Instant Anatomy website and the podcast and stuff, he draws his own kind of like hand-drawn diagrams which are not overly complicated and done in a sort of way that helps you understand what the anatomy is like because you really can't see it, you know, in a proper textbook with like proper accurate diagrams. So Instant Anatomy is really good for that. Instant Anatomy is also really good for finding the general rules of anatomy. And what do I mean by that? I mean that it's a general rule that all the muscles in the posterior compartment of the arm are supplied by the radial nerve. And this is not something that you would typically see in a textbook. Instead, you would see a big ass table of all the muscles in the arm and some of them in the posterior and you'll see kind of next to them radial nerve or interosseous branch of the radial nerve or whatever. And like, like no one would actively tell you that actually, you know, you don't, don't have to learn any of those. All you have to remember is that all of the muscles here are supplied by the radial nerve. Done. Wonderful. Okay. Next rule. All of the muscles in the flexor compartment of the arm are supplied by the medial nerve. Wonderful. With the exception of flexor carpi ulnaris and another one that I can't remember. So, you know, these rules and exceptions, like all of the muscles of the, all of the intrinsic muscles of the larynx are supplied by the recurrent laryngeal nerve with the exception of cricopharyngeus, which is supply, supplied by the uh, internal branch of the superior laryngeal nerve or something like that but you know <laughs> it's been a, it's been a long time since i've done this but even then like you know these rules that i repeated over and over and over space repetition have stuck in my head and i find that now that i'm an act actual doctor i've forgotten the vast majority of anatomy but the stuff that i remember is the stuff that i used to have these rules about you know all the intrinsic muscles of the hand are supplied by the ulnar nerve with the exception of loaf lateral lumbricals opponents pollicis abductor pollicis brevis and flexor pollicis brevis which are supplied by the median nerve you know nice and easy and then suddenly you've got the nerve supply for all the muscles in the hand and you don't have to memorize that whole table so that is something that i'd really encourage you to do with anatomy and the website instant anatomy really helps with that and there's there's loads of other mnemonics you know mnemonics for brachial plexus mnemonics for the branches of the external carotid artery all of this sort of stuff these are all really really good but having said that you can't just learn anatomy by learning these rules because you know there is a lot of specific stuff and for that i think anki and just flashcards in general are absolutely incredibly useful for anatomy a lot of anatomy is kind of seeing flexor carpi radialis and knowing what the blood supply is and what the what the nerve supply is. And that's the sort of thing that flashcards just are, just completely change the game. If you can use flashcards with active, re active recall, well, you know, by definition, they're flashcards and spaced repetition, which stuff like Anki have built into them by default. Let's say, you know, you didn't know that that was the median nerve, you would click it was hard and then it would come up again in a few minutes time. And let's say you did know it was the median nerve, you would click that was easy and it'd come up in a few days time. So th like, stuff like Anki is just really helpful for anatomy. It's absolutely incredible. So point number one, use websites like Instant Anatomy and just random bits on Google and Wikipedia and stuff to learn the general rules and the exceptions of anatomy. And once you've done that, then you can start memorizing the sort of nitty gritty details and a flashcard app like Anki is absolutely perfect for that. I would not recommend any textbooks. Um, the textbook Clinically Oriented Anatomy is all right. Uh, I sort of used it a bit in my anatomy essays because we had to write essays, but the vast majority of medical students don't have to write essays about you know, how bones grow or about you know the structure of the upper limb or how the, you know, the hip joint makes it ideal for weight bearing. Um, you know, textbooks are totally pointless if your exam is multiple choice. Anki and Instant Anatomy would be my personal recommendations.
Let's talk about pharmacology. Uh, as medical students and as doctors, we have to learn a list of a ton of drugs. And by far, the best way of doing that is by using Anki. Anki is amazing. Um, in my second year, we had pharmacology and me and two of my housemates, Callum and Paul, who you might have seen on the vlogs if you've been following the channel, um, we were all living together. So I started making an Anki deck uh, of all of the drugs that we needed to know. And as we would go through the lectures, I would just add the drugs that we came across to this Anki deck. And then once a week or so, we would all get an order from a city kebab. I'd get uh, a chicken donut with meat and chips with a barbecue sauce and mayonnaise and, and Callum would get his own chicken wrap uh, and Paul would probably just cook his noodles at home because you know he just didn't really he wasn't really a fan of kebabs anyway so we'd sit in my room and we'd just bash through these flashcards and by the time kind of exam term came around we'd already learned all of the drugs and knew them with like the back of our hands we would see I don't know edrophonium and instantly know exactly what his mechanism of action was and exactly what it was used for and that was that felt like a superpower that you know just by putting in about an hour a week Working together, it's fun, you're having a kebab, it's a, it's a good time, you've got some music in the background, and just bashing through drugs. It's, it's just like, A, really enjoyable. It's like one of the fond memories I've got of medical school doing these drugs with uh, Callum and Paul. That sounds weird. Um, but yeah, it's fun, it's efficient, you know, it just takes an hour a week, and Anki is by far the best way of learning pharmacology. Don't, again, don't worry about textbooks. Oh, actually, if you if you do want a book, the, the book Medical Pharmacology at a Glance is like this thick. It's like tiny and it's really, really good. That was what I used to get first classes in my pharmacology essays. And it's just got great diagrams. I learned a lot of the diagrams and just bashed them into my essay. And diagrams generally in Oxford and Cambridge essays are big plus, so diagrams are good. Yeah, medical pharmacology at a glance. If you do want a book, it's quite good. Otherwise, and key for pharmacology. What about biochemistry? Uh, again, this sort of depends on what your medical school makes you learn. So like I said, we had to do stuff about the sodium pump and we had to learn the Krebs cycle. Some people don't have to learn the Krebs cycle. But regardless, biochemistry, you know, just drawing out diagrams over and over again. It's like, it's sort of like A-level chemistry where you had those reaction mechanisms of electrophilic addition and nucleophilic substitution and all that stuff. Um, just drawing out the diagram over and over again is a, like a really good way of, of getting good at those. For physiology, like I said, Guyton and Hall is quite a good textbook, but to be honest, a lot of the explanations for stuff you can find on Wikipedia. Um, and I think the, the, the real key thing about physiology is to be able to explain the concept to a five-year-old. And, and, and often with physiology, it's just a case of flowcharts. So, you know, let's say you're talking about how the buffer system in the blood works in an, in an essay about kidneys, or just trying to understand how the kidneys work to buffer the blood. Or you can say that, okay, let's say you add 10 H plus ions into your blood, then, you know, next step that dissociates, you know, into H plus, HCO3 minus, whatever that, and then you get a little bit of a shift in the kidneys, and then you get the renin angiotensin aldosterone system doing this, and then you get release of this from the tubules and it's it's like a very sort of stepwise process i've forgotten all my kidney physiology but it's fine it doesn't matter because i'm doing cardiology at the moment um but yeah so it's, it's very kind of flow chart based and the more you can explain it in very simple words to a five-year-old the better you'll do and finally i think like pathology is the other big topic that you get in first and second year um the key for pathology really is a to understand the general concepts the principles of inflammation the principles of the immune system all the lines of defense all of that sort of stuff but then again using anki for the specifics but also using a mixture of rules so for example with pathology you probably have to learn the classification of loads of different types of bacteria um, one way of doing that is by saying that everything is a gram-negative rod unless it's not okay fine <laughs> what are the ones that aren't okay so is it if it's a gram-positive coccus it's either a staph or a strep if it's a gram-negative coccus it's either neisseria or moraxella if it's a gram-positive rod it is going to be a b c d or l so actinomyces bacillus act bacillus anthracis or bacillus aureus uh, c for clostridium d for chronobacterium diphtheria and l for listeria and then everything else is a gram-negative rod and suddenly you've learned the classific the gram classification of every single bacteria you could imagine without having to memorize all of it because you've worked out the system and this sort of or you found it on the internet you know you've just got some kind of system that gives you the rules and gives you the exception the rule being everything is a gram negative rod the exceptions being except these eight things which is a lot easier to learn than you know the list of 100 bacteria um, once you've understood it and once you've got as much as you can out of the rules and the exceptions you then want to just be learning the specifics and again Anki is just in a class of its own for learning the specifics of stuff like that learning what IL1 interleukin 2 interleukin 5 interleukin 17 do learning what like all the different inflammatory mediators do learning what type of viruses is you know a toga virus and a flavivirus virus and a picorna virus and all that stuff all that stuff you know Anki is just absolutely wonderful for that so again I won't really recommend any textbook for preclinical pathology for clinical pathology, Robins, baby Robins, the little tiny one is quite good. 
The big one is kind of a bit pointless because it's just too much information. Um, but those would be my recommended resources because uh, a lot of you have asked. And I'll do a more detailed video about this where I've interviewed a lot of my other friends about what they would recommend. Uh, and a few of them recommend textbooks, but for the most part, people generally say that you don't really need textbooks. And the general vibe I've gotten from a lot of my friends is that we all bought loads of textbooks back in the day because we were, you know, <laughs> we, we like wanted to be good medical students with these big textbooks. But then the vast majority of us just didn't open any of them. Okay, this video has gone on really long and I could just continue going on about this for absolutely hours. I hope it's been useful so far. But point number 10, the final bit, the bit that we're going to use to end this video is please work together. Medicine is not a competition. You might have thought of it as a competition for getting into medical school because it's all like competitive and stuff. Even then, like you should work together. Um, anyway, please work together. You know, find friends, find colleagues, work together, share notes, share resources, help each other out. There is absolutely nothing for you to gain from trying to, you know, withhold information from you, from your, from your friends, from people in your college, from people in your class. Like, yeah, sort of if you think about it far enough that if someone else does better than you, then that means you're less likely to get a first, sort of. But I think that's a very, that's a very inner, like a suboptimal way of, oops, that's a very suboptimal way of approaching this whole medical school thing because it really doesn't matter what sort of grades you get. Like, especially when you're in first and second year, like literally no one cares that you got a first in anatomy or that you didn't get a first in anatomy. Um, like th think of how little you care about your year eight history grade right now. And that's kind of the position that I'm now in looking back at my first year medical student self and thinking, why did I, why did I care so much about, you know, getting that extra mark in anatomy? And if you're the sort of person that cared so much about getting those extra marks in anatomy that you tried to screw over your friends in the process of doing so, then, you know, that's just not a nice, that's not a nice place to be to live your life, really. Um, <laughs> whereas if you're the sort of person that was like, you know what, I'm going to try doing my best. I'm going to work with my friends. We're going to have a great time together. You, then you're the sort of person who will form happy memories of you and your friends working together. You'll be friends for life. And you'll think of medical school as a much more fun and engaging and pleasant experience than if you had this very sort of competitive mindset, thinking that it's you against everyone else and you're out to beat them. Because really, you know, we're all going to be doctors. No one really cares how you do in your exams. Work together, you know, make friends, be happy, have a good time. Ultimately, you know, you're in medical school for most people between the ages of like 18 and 24, which are some of, you know, the prime years of your life. They say that university is supposed to be the best time of your life. You know, like, <laughs> If you, if you just like work together and you're friendly and warm and nice to people and you're not a dick and you're not mean and you don't try and screw people over and you just like treat it as, in a way, just sort of treat it as a game. You're all in this game together. You're all, you know, battling against the exams together. You will have an infinitely better time than if you treat medical school as a competitive exercise in getting to the top. So yeah, work together with your friends, ask people in the years above for their notes, for their resources, share those resources with people you know. Uh, it's just the best way forward. So thank you so much for watching. I really hope this has been useful. Uh, stay tuned for the other 19 plus videos in this series called How to Survive Medical School, where me and loads of my friends are going to be giving you advice on how to do various things, like how to get publications, how to do well on essays, how to revise for OSCEs, how to revise for written exams, how to, did I say how to write essays, work-life balance, how many hours should you work, how to make notes, good apps for medical students. Just got loads of those, loads of them already. Um, I spent the last six months kind of getting people into my room while I was still a medical student in my final year and asking them all of these various questions. So we've got a ton of footage that I just need to get around. Whoops, I keep hitting this. I just need to get around to editing into a into a series of coherent videos. So yeah, I really hope that was useful. Um, if you're a first year medical student or any sort of medical student watching this, then I'm kind of jealous because you are at the start of what is an absolutely incredible experience or rather what has the potential to be an absolutely incredible experience provided you know you manage to get through the exams without without destroying yourself and provided you work together and be nice and don't be a dick and stuff. Um, so you're in an incredible position and you know, just have a great time. Like medical student, like being a medical student is hard work, but it's also a lot of fun. And when you're in my position and you're a junior doctor and you're looking back on that time, you wanna be thinking, you know what? I'm really glad I spent those six years in medical school. I had a wonderful time and I made great friends and I learned a lot and that is, Alhamdulillah, praise the Lord, the position that I'm in at the moment. So yeah, I really hope this video was useful. Uh, if you liked it, please give it a thumbs up. If you haven't subscribed to the channel, please consider doing so. Have a lovely day and I will see you in the next video. Goodbye.